All right, so average citizens, some experiencers, some non-experiencers, turn disclosure advocates. Today's guest will be one of those. Which one? You'll have to wait and see today on The Social Dig. All right, welcome back to The Social Dig. Uh, we have here our first guest here ever, writer, producer, sky watcher, disclosure advocate, first guest on the social dig, new friend of the show. You may know him by his social media handle, at Anonymous Rex, contributor to shows like Disclosure Tonight with Thomas Fessler and David Scott Spaced Out Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tim Senor, how are you today? Well, I'm doing great. Thank you for that great intro. Yeah, no problem at all. You deserve it, sir. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. So, um, just getting into it, uh, uh, you know, I know you from what I see on uh, for being a fan of these shows. Uh, just want to get you to tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I kind of, I, sure. I kind of know a few things about you, but I want to see. I want, I want you to surprise me today. Yeah, no, I'll bring you up to the speed. Sure. So. I'm a dad of five. Um, that's that's my number one role, you know, dad and husband. But uh, I, I was a producer and I owned a film production company in California for about 15 years and then uh, sold that, moved to Hawaii and uh, had some new little babies and uh, decided to move back to the mainland for an education for them and to move off of the big island which was erupting and is even erupting even more now um and so brought us to oregon where i restarted my production company uh and so in 2019 i had a pretty big uh ufo sighting that I witnessed with my nine family members all at once. It was kind of an undeniable thing that ended up shifting my career back into film. And uh, having a family that is all PhDs and scientists and ex-military, it sent me kind of down the research rabbit hole into this uh, investigating UFO. And yeah, so, so you have a background yeah. in psychology, right? Yeah, I do. I've, I've got a degree in film and psychology. And so this kind of united them. It nice. did in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so that brings me kind of to where I am today, where I started an um, independent research company and fully financed it myself. So we stay true to our goal, which is to just find out whatever we can about the phenomenon and present it in a real simple way, a transparent way that we show all of our work, all of our data and put it into a few free documentaries and put it into a few PowerPoint presentations that we can hopefully put into the right hands and have it presented to Congress. Nice. Nice. I, I know I heard you mention before, uh, I was watching, I forget what show you were on, but I know you were talking about uh, starting this. So uh, had you collected any data or what, what generally were you doing out there? So after my sighting with my family in 2019, I, I was really just kind of lost, to, to be honest. And I found this community, you know, on YouTube uh, helped me kind of dig into it a little bit. It was really helpful. And um, not to stray too far off of your question here, but that's kind of initially what drew me in. And so are you asking if the research portion happened naturally or, or I'm sorry? Well, yeah, I, I, I feel, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I feel that because I definitely looked into your sighting and I, I know the story behind it and I would love for you to tell it, but I feel like uh, that drove you maybe to wanting to take this step to uh to do something to benefit this disclosure movement definitely um initially 
um, I started buying, you know, tools here and there, you know, IR cameras and Gen 3 night vision and things like that. So I could see, you know, again, what I'd experienced. Um, absolutely. You know, that that sighting was impactful to to me in a big way. And so I did take it upon myself just to find out more for myself because it was affecting family members, you know, and um, not all necessarily in a positive way. So I was very motivated in that sense. And once I realized via YouTube and friends that the work I was doing should be shared because I was getting good data and great video and things like that. And so I started sharing it and um, realized that I needed to take it a step further. Um, and so I invested in a mobile lab and filled it with tools and have started taking it to hotspots to find my own information. And then once I find that, I kind of corroborate it amongst my peer group, which is expanding now to some incredible organizations, including members of SCU, um, the Scientific Co Coalition for the Study of UAP, mm -hmm. uh, and so other members uh, and uh, people in the science community and the uh, engineering community that have helped me come up with devices to put in there um, that have never been seen before, in, in fact. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, um, you know, it has snowballed into something that I definitely never foresaw um, in my career. Um, but I find that all the little skills that I've picked up in my life have brought me to where I am. So, um, I haven't put up too many, you know, fights when things have come up in my mind. I'm like, should I do this? I just should. Like I I've said yes to everything. Yes. So, man. And I, and I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I you know, I heard your story and I, I know that you mentioned, uh, that you initially, really weren't even into the subject uh, until you had your experience. And that kind of is what sparked everything for you. I did want to know prior to that, were you a believer in UFOs? Like, did you believe they existed or where, yeah. where were you at before that? Your side. Um, I had seen close encounters and ET and I'm a star Wars fan. Um, but in no way was it a reality. Um, I, you know, my parents gave me a great telescope as a kid and we had a flat roof growing up in New York. And mm -hmm. so I would get up on our roof with that telescope and just spend endless hours up there. And there was nothing I ever saw. Now, given in the 80s, um, there weren't as many satellites and things to confuse people and myself, but I never saw anything I couldn't explain. So, you know, really, uh, honestly, I never considered it a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so when our family had this experience, it was really, really undeniable. It was either something that was just out of the box military or something else, you know, and um, I captured a lot of photos of it and we had a lot of eyes on it. And, you know, once we decided to make it public and to send it to the right people, uh, to make sure it wasn't anything uh, that was ours, we decided to go public. You know, once everywhere said this is this is real UFO. Yeah, I did see the pictures too, and those are, they're pretty clear. Uh, what I'll do is I don't know if you have the ability. I think you can share from your end if you have them, but if not, I can put them in post. Either way, yeah, we'll put them in post. Absolutely, okay. I have some great okay. images that I'd love to share. Yeah, real yeah. clear uh, tic tac, uh, pretty pretty much undeniable daytime sighting. Yeah, uh, very similar to mine's. Uh, I have an undeniable, and actually, I'm doing a video on it. It's it's this. Um, it's pretty awesome. Oh, I'd um, love to hear yeah, about it. I think you saw the actual raw video. Okay, but I actually uh, came across some new information that kind of really solidifies. Uh, Mick West chimed in and said, "Oh, it's birds." No, right. we actually have corrupt corroborating evidence at this point that clearly shows not birds. It, and it's so tough, isn't it? It's so tough to put your 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 sighting out there. Um, I've yeah. never had. I did have some people that came. 
um, out of the woodwork and tried to kind of help me in some other options of what it could be. Um, but I didn't consider, you know, um, experimental holographic military experiments over a busy city, really a plausible explanation, no. um, which was one. But you notice that people really have to reach, you know, they're reaching. Yes. And so I find it very frustrating, you know, that people say balloons and birds for things that, or, you know, um, banners being towed by planes or um, oh, yes. there's so many mundane explanations that are out there that are frustrating because the thing is, honestly, if you were to look at my photographs without the story, you could easily be like, that's, that's nothing. Um, and I'd be fine with that because you haven't gotten the story. Right. And right. the unfortunate part, and I feel like it separates a skeptic from uh, a debunker, let's say a skeptic is open to any interpretation, even if it's UFO, a debunker refuses to accept UFO and will just do anything to come up with an explanation. And, they refuse the witness account often, which is incredibly frustrating. And you need it. You need the witness account. It's incredibly important. Oh, yeah. And, and I feel like the witness takes quite a bit of abuse out there. Um, and it's, it's not fair. It's not fair, um, really. You know, it's so hard to come out with this stuff. And then mm -hmm. to be um, debunked, I think, it is brutal. You know, in, in my what i did was the sighting took place august 28th it was pretty much to me undeniable i called a few people immediately and told them what i saw still have the video i know just you have your old iphone with your video mm -hmm. i kept same camera i raw video on my phone as well i'm using it as my camera right now actually <laughs> now i didn't i didn't post it or really think about reaching out it took, took like a month i sat on the video and i just didn't know what to do i was at the point to where okay maybe i can go ahead and report this to mufon then i got to their terms and conditions and how they take ownership so i wasn't really they take ownership but, of the data not your video okay okay and i, I believe i already say that to be so i wanted to get that clarified yeah because i still want to report the case to have it reported yeah I'm just okay well that's good so Thing is, is that, you know, without the, and, and literally in the video, these, there's 47 objects and within about a minute, they all disappear. Clear blue sky, sun, high noon, yeah. nothing to obstruct any view. And I feel like they went through, like you showed a portal mm -hmm. uh, with your Tic Tac. And it almost seemed like that's what happened. They went through a portal. And then right after they disappeared, you know, there were three people standing there. Everybody saw that it disappeared. And then right after that, I stopped recording. And right in the spot where they disappeared, there was what appeared to me, it looked like, like a military jet, mm -hmm. but it made no sound. And it was briefly there for one second and kind of just disappeared. So it was very like similar to what man. you were saying. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Very well, similar. I mean, when I saw your. Uh, data, it reminded me of A Tear in the Sky, the film by Carolyn yes, Corey. Yes, sir. Where she had just on, you know, uh, her UFO DAP system, it recorded, uh, which is an automated robot cam, basically, that captures stuff in the sky in multiple spectrums. It captured, I think they said 60 some objects. Right. Uh, coming through. And then you know, they drop down to the ground. That blows my it's mind. So, it, it's so funny you say that because I literally, maybe a week ago, just watched the uh, YouTube video for the UPX findings that they released back in June. Yeah. And they had a segment where they were showing what they were calling a portal and then a bunch of little dots inside of it that they said were mm -hmm. individual items. And that's, that's the same thing I thought when I saw that. When I saw that, I said, I'm sure that that's what that was. I'm yeah. sure it's, it's the same thing. That and I, I forget them. what, where in the world was yours and was it over land or sea? 
Uh, it's over right over uh, Bakersfield, California. If you're familiar with Southern California, I am. Yeah, I am. So that's not far off the. So they were right there in the the Channel Islands, right? So yes, exactly, exactly. It's a hundred. Uh, I think it's about 120 miles from here. If you you know straight through to Catalina Island. So my sighting was a thousand miles from there. And it happened 10 days before the Omaha. Yeah, I did hear you say that as you well. Know. So that that's pretty peculiar. I mean, what you have in that picture, and once again, we're going to show it for sure. Right. Definitely yeah. shows a Tic Tac. I mean, yeah. it's definitely a Tic Tac. Um, and it's a shame that I don't have those. I should have sent. I didn't know you wanted to cover my sighting. No, that's okay. Honest. I we'll should have sent them post. first because I have them all numbered. And I, I often am, I'm happy to go through each, you know, frame by frame, but the final frame, unfortunately, the 11th frame, um, which was after the portal had closed and the Tic Tac had moved, you know, they were shooting off south. There were more objects than just the disc and the Tic Tac that I initially witnessed. There was a third object. And right. so my guess is that you know, when that portal was open, I did photograph something either coming or going through it. And we can assume perhaps that I photographed this object coming out because there were three when they left. And that, mm -hmm. that was actually a pyramid shaped object. And it, it came out kind of in a dark gray in color, the same so the, color as the disc. The third object was, was actually pyramid shaped? Pyramid, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's what the photo showed. And I had to do some enhancement to bring it out. And the, the frustrating thing again, um, you know, I'm not saying that this is definitely what took place. It's kind of like what we witnessed and it, it seems to fit this, the series of events, but even with all my experience, I still don't know, you know, and that's, yeah. what's so frustrating. frustrating. Like you don't, you don't know. Right. And it's part of the search and like that frustrating, not knowing is what triggered me to like, do everything i'm doing now you know including um the news and being involved in this topic you know it's a hard topic to get into um but again uh without those photos you and i would never have met honestly right right um, i got you know, that feeling definitely yeah. no and and i was just like i was telling uh uh, my friend of the show here, Mateo, which we'll have coming in a moment here. Yeah. Um, I told him that, you know, these sightings, like you have, you have a situation where just like you, you know, I saw your earlier interviews where you were really, you know, it, it was really hard for you to kind of emotionally for you to talk about your incident. And a lot of it was really because you had just the photos and your memory and you have the debunkers that say, well, that's not enough. And so it kind of puts you in a situation where you feel like, okay, well, why did I even come out and say anything? And I think that's kind of what the problem is for a lot of uh, potential people who don't get the courage or get discouraged before they actually come out and say what they saw even if it was something they only saw for a moment, every sighting counts. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, I find it, it's a little sad, you know, that our community eats itself like that. We should be more welcoming because it's hard to talk about. And whether or not you have photographs, you should be able to talk about it. Um, now me coming into it, I, I don't think I would have, um talked about it at all if i didn't have those photos you know and the day of that sighting we took them home and laid them out on the table in ipad form and on the computer and really went over them and like i said two military witnesses in the family two phds and um then the rest of us with just open minds we sat around and we really couldn't figure it out and so that was the moment that we decided that I had to kind of report it. And so I wrote, reported to move on. And uh, I think, I think I reported it to New Fork as well. Yeah, no, you did. I found yeah. your report actually. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, but really, um, once the once the reports came back, it actually took frustratingly a few months. Initially, I didn't have a high opinion of MUFON because I was like, what's up, you know, with my data. But finally, I realized now that, you know, they only have a certain amount of time and they took as long as they could. And um, with this case, because it was really it was a tough one mm -hmm. to to close. And so they finally came back with it being UAP, part of the 5%, you know, the cases that come back as true UAP. Wow. And that was the moment that I personally was like, okay, I can talk about it. Um, because, you know, I didn't want to be the guy that has photos of a secret military operation or something, even if it was over Seattle, Washington, it, still, I wouldn't be talking about it, you know, if it was our right. tech. Um, but um, once... I realized it was something else then you know that really launched me down this rabbit hole so what is your well i know the kid you, i know you said during the sighting uh your wife was not there right but one of your kids w was there so all of my kids except for um my second oldest oh okay, okay. So for all four behind. of my kids two of my wife's or I'm sorry, two of uh, my sisters, uh, no, three of my sisters were there. So yeah, it added up to nine people, you know, and so both my sister and her husband are both uh, ex-military and then my mother and father are both PhD'd. And, um, you know, initially it wasn't me that that saw this. Um, it, it, was a, it was my mother, in fact, that heard something. And when she looked up, she saw a disc just sitting there in the sky. You know, that, that was just the beginning of, of what took place. But So I did see as well that you uh, were going to do a, a documentary. Well, not really necessarily documentary, but you were saying that you wanted to get them on film discussing uh, their what they remember from uh, the sighting. Mm -hmm. Did you do that? Or? I did. Okay. I actually ended up getting all my family members to do it. Oh, nice. Is but that is that out yet? I don't really. So if I was to do a documentary on my sighting, I would include it. Um, but at this point, I don't have anyone's permission. Mm, right. Okay. And so when I did it, I was just explaining, I just want this to be part history of our family record. history. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I've always made videos my whole young life. So this isn't out of the ordinary for me to do, except I've used less makeup and no costumes this time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they were fine doing it, but, um, you know, my dad was okay with me talking about it publicly and he passed away this past summer. So I know oh, at wow. some point I can include his story. My mom's still around. She's not okay with it you know, being out there publicly. So um, I've kept her and her story is awesome. And I'll, I mean, she's okay with me telling it, but she doesn't want her film, sure. you know, out there at this point. So. Do you feel comfortable at least just giving us a gist of what she may have said? Well, sure. Um, you know, her story is part of the story that I tell publicly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, initially that she described the sound that she heard really well and she describes the action of the tic tac around the saucer really well she's just got a great way of speaking we're um so we're british uh you know uh moved to america when i was very young so you know very descriptive in in every way and uh, my mom ended up being a teacher so again right she's she's a great person to have been a witness to this um she remembers every detail still you know and she's 86 wow so uh yeah just incredible her description of the sound um and so my assumption is that this potentially is the sound that the portal made when it opened or closed and her description of that was the sound of um an uncoiling of um, saran wrap and like stretching, but like mm. more of the elastic kind of like, you know, like sound, right. but, and then add a metallic element to that. Ooh. 
so like a metallic stretching sound yeah yeah it's really hard to explain but i did hear it sound like a portal opened up yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but on a massive scale like as if it was like on a scale of thunder you know wow okay which is bizarre because i didn't hear it initially but my dad and mom did um none of the family members down by the ocean heard it um but i i did the second time that it happened because it did the sound happened again when that portal opened and that's kind of why my description is a little different because it's it didn't sound at all like a boom like there was no way it was um a sonic, sonic boom, boom or thunder yeah. um it, it wasn't you know a clear clear day but it was in no way weather there was no weather um but my description is is definitely more of a stretching like more like a creak i mean you know how like if a door oh, or bending wood creaks if you're to yes bend, sir kind of sounded like that to me um That's at the strange. same time as uh this beam came out of the tic tac and this portal opened um and i'll give you guys the full story including when i when i heard all of that but um, and then my mother gave a great description of how the Tic Tac um, seemed to move around the disc. And so if this was the disc, her description was that the Tic Tac kind of always was pointing at it the same way, but like a hummingbird, like it would be right. here and then it would suddenly be here Erratic and it would be movements. here and then yeah. it would be over here. And it was more of a sparkle at this point. It, we didn't know that it was a Tic Tac until we saw the photographs. We never saw until or until it stopped because it did look like a uh, a white cigar when it stopped. But initially, when it was up close and it was moving rapidly around the saucer-shaped object, it appeared more of a sparkle because I did see it myself. Now, question I have, because like I said, I, I've definitely... Uh know about your the this story mm -hmm. uh how what i was unclear on is did the uap did did it simply go off into the distance until you couldn't see it or did it disappear or what what happened there i think you said you saw it until it went off until you couldn't see it anymore that's correct it, okay. it it moved south the same way the objects had been moving which was kind of like i would see it and then it would be here and then it would be here it, it was not, it wasn't like ever flying i can't say that i ever saw it flying but what i would see was it would just it, it was potentially moving so quick quickly that you know my eye wasn't picking it up my camera definitely wasn't picking it up there were some points in some of my photos that there was no objects in it and then the next photo there they'd all be again wow so the way it moved was odd but it moved off south the same way it had uh, before the portal opened up a very strange way of moving and this was another thing that really bends my brain was how it moved um like even when it was up close i i never saw the saucer flying it was just static and mm -hmm. then it was even though i was looking right at it it would just be gone and then it would be there like way off in the distance wow. and i'm looking at it and then my dad's over my shoulder going oh look down there and i look down there and it's there and i look back and it's not there it's there and i'm like so it was blinking out as it went across the sky so it wasn't flying it just was appearing in different locations I'm a, yeah. Essentially, yeah. yeah. That is how it I interpreted what I witnessed. Yeah. Wow. I never saw it moving across the sky. Yeah. So yes, that's 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 pretty crazy. It, now yeah. I know you talked also about the fact that you thought or you felt like uh for some reason your family members weren't able to recall the sighting initially, or how did that play out? yeah that was and, and i also kind of had a strange kind of mental dumbing down if you will is kind of the way it felt like when we tried initially it, it's easier now that i talk about it but initially before any of us were talking about it it was like really hard to recall or to get started on on it um 
things would distract us off of it. Some of my photographs after I walked away just back to the parking lot, I have a photograph of a bush, I have a mm-hmm. photograph of the uh, hub of um, my truck, the, you know, the tire hub. I have no reason. I don't remember taking those. I have no reason to take those. It wasn't accidental. Excuse me. So, um, yeah. And so, the reason that I wanted to videotape my family members was because of this kind of weird psychological phenomenon that, uh, you know, we all kind of had, which was just this mental block to recall it. And to be honest, none of my family members like talking about the minute and a half that that portal was open. It was a two and a half minute, uh, you know, series of photos from the first to the last and there was a minute and a half of, you know, that portal being open, static, not moving at all in the sky. And um, they don't like, to, none of us like talking about that in particular, just because it's just weird, just a weird thing. And some of them don't recall the sound, some do. The descriptions vary a little bit. Um, the duration of the event definitely vary. I had no idea it was that long. Mm -hmm. Um, It didn't feel that long. It felt like seconds. Um, But then again, that night, you know, we were all recalling it and it just seemed like it was hard to recall details, Mm -hmm. you know, even though it it shouldn't have been, you know, Uh, we had to struggle to do so. Now, I guess. So did you feel that that was an effect of the UAP or? What, why do you think they couldn't recall, you know, seeing this object in the sky? I think it's a combination. I don't want to go down the woo train here, mm-hmm. but the psychology aspect of it makes me feel like it's just kind of like too big. And so people are compartmentalizing these things in their brain as they're interpreting mm. it. And so, like, I'm seeing that and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is X. Meanwhile, the person next to me could have a slightly different interpretation and be like, this is why, you know what I mean? And so um, none of us are, even though we're educated in religion, none of us follow any particular religion, but easily we could have explained it off as something religious, perhaps. Right, right. Not saying that any of us did, or spiritual for that matter, because obviously we're spiritual, but we're not necessarily religious. Right. I feel there's a distinction, but um, it's a tough question to answer for all of my family members because um, I saw them struggling a little bit during their interviews. Um, one family member was like, when do you want to do that interview? And I'm like, we already did it. And I, I, I wrote notes that that happened. Um, so, there was an element I can't decipher whether the source of this dumbing down came from uh, the things in the sky or the event itself or the interpretation of the event. There's definitely a few factors there that I'm considering. Well, with that being said, I mean, we talked about how that drove you into now doing uh, what you're doing on the sky watching. Um, what for you, what is the end goal? Like, what do you want to accomplish with this new venture that you had? Is it is it to necessarily validate the sighting that you had? Or what what is it, you know, what is your mission at this point? Right. Um, well, so on a very personal level, I would like the effects of this. I'd like to figure out why it's happening and maybe make it stop. Because... Every night I have dreams, you know, and other family members do. And it's a lingering effect. And so I, I, on a personal level, I'd like to know why that's happening, you know, still. Right. <laughs> um, and then on a, on a much bigger level, um, once I realized that this was real and then I was actually able to go out with tools and record this, and it's not just a figment of my imagination and, you know, the world isn't going crazy. These things are really there. They're physically there. And I'm not sure if it's nuts and bolts or what it is, but um, I feel incredibly motivated to find out why, because it's an answer that needs to come. 
right? We can't just sit on our heels and let things just happen to us. You know, that's not the way people work. I am a proactive person. And so I took it on myself to take it to the next level. And any truth I find, I am going to disclose. And that's the biggest thing. It's it's massive. And a big part of my project is um, with live cams. So we're on location in a hotspot. We have live cams on the interior of my lab so you guys can see what we're doing. I've got a cab, oh, wow. uh, a cam on my weather station, and then live cams up in the sky so you guys can look into multi- multi-spectrums with us. Oh, wow. And in the chat, you can put in the notes, hey, according to your weather station, this just dropped. Or, hey, I just saw this in camera you know, C or D and um, become a part of it, right? Me personally, I feel like disclosure already happened, like for me personally. Yeah, me and I, I also feel like even in the government, I mean, it's pretty obvious if you've got a uh, UAP task force, right. I don't know what else you're waiting for. But hey, everyone has their own uh, agenda and what they need to feel like this is real. And I get that. But um, for me, disclosure has already happened. I'm out there looking for data because I need to prove it to myself that it's real and hopefully I can find answers for me and my family. And then on a bigger picture, I'd like to show what I find to the world and have them also scratch their heads and be like, maybe, you know, this is an answer or this is one way to look for it. Well, you were prepared, even though I know you said when you first saw it, you didn't have your phone. You had to run back to the truck and get it. But you did exactly that and you were able to get it on film which a lot of people just miss it and just have a story to tell so you definitely have something uh physical tangible to contribute uh to getting closer to validating that proof so yeah uh, as far as the 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 cameras that you stated that you have uh are those live or those are we able to go somewhere and watch those or working on getting them up live right now at a brand new location we just settled in on Um, and so this week I'm going to have them up and live. So yeah, you're going to be able to go to our website, which I'll be able to give you here in post. Cool. And, um, it's going to be in McMinnville, Oregon, which is the site actual location of the first UFO photograph ever at the Trent property. If you're familiar, Yes. um, one of my, uh, tech operators owns that property. And so we have it stashed there for, uh, a good duration and we're going to have it live, you know, looking at the skies of McMinnville, Oregon. Oh yeah. Oh, and yeah. it gets clear. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm down here in Southern California. So it's, it's wide open here. Uh, if you guys ever branch out and uh, I know you were looking to get trucks for different parts yeah. of the country. Yeah. So if you end up wanting to place one down here, you know, I'll man it. I'll be, I'll, definitely man it so just let me know i appreciate that you might find yourself uh dedicating some some time you can actually it's really cool too because you can actually stream live from the back usually uh you know because we set up with starlink so you can just you know go anywhere it's been really successful summer um and we just started in june you know with the first uh mobile lab and we hope to expand at least one or two annually um, depending on how many people we can onboard. And it's really just about finding people like yourself that actually have the time to do it and, um, you know, just keep everything running live. Uh, the good thing is, is the data, like, honestly, and somebody asked me this recently, like, do you know how to operate all of the devices on in your lab? And I absolutely don't. Um, <laughs> I, I bring on professionals. Like, my radar right. operator is Kevin Day. Oh, right? wow. Okay. Like, and in no way do I know how to run radar or, or fix it or understand the data that it provides, but I have an expert that translates for me. Wow. Right. I- and so that's the kind of thing I adopt uh, team members that are professionals and the best in their field. And that's who I have working with me. So people like Tom King, he's a UFO DAP expert yes, and he's running all of my UFO DAP. Shout out, Tom King. Shout out, TK. Yeah. And um, if I have questions on any of my technical devices, um, if I find that I need to look into a certain field, um, well, I make a call to someone like Dave Mason, 
you know, and Dave Mason is an absolute genius. And um, he designed binoculars that translate light into waveforms, uh, you yes. know, and basically oh, give a signature to UAP. So I can look at a plane and know by the waveform that it's just a plane. Don't oh. waste your time, you know. Nice. Genius. Absolute yeah, you, genius. Yeah, that, that, those, that's a, those are major name drops there, man. I mean, well, so, and yeah. I do so just to explain that I, it's not me, right? No. I, I'm just a coordinator. That's a great I, I bring on people that know what to do and then yeah. shine the light on them. That's a great um, team. Yeah. I, standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad we had this discussion. I wanted to get to know who you were and have you talk to the people and kind of explain your story and where you came from. I know you've done it before, but this is a little different. Yeah. Um, now I wanted to get into talking about some of the more technical stuff, some of the more current stuff. And uh, for that, I'm going to bring in my guy, Mateo, and I know he has some, a few things that uh, he wanted to bring up as well. So introducing the engineer to Social Dig, Mr. Mateo, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Rob, and uh, hello, Tim. It's a great pleasure and honor to meet you and uh, loved hearing your story here. Great respect from, uh, out to you for all you've uh, done and gone through and what you're doing right now. I uh, really respect your mission. I uh, like the personal aspect of your mission to try to explain the whys and make it stop. But I also respect your mission to bring it to the rest of the world. And that's you know, why I like contributing to the social dig here in Rob's channel for, for those Rob reasons. So uh, anyhow, Great Thank to be you. here and uh, great to participate. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. That's yeah. Awesome. So, Mateo, I know you, uh, we were talking earlier, well, we, in the last episode or so mm -hmm. about the UAP report and UAP report being late. Uh, what is the state of disclosure? What do you feel like the state of disclosure is? Uh, what do you feel about the UAP report? And I'd like to get your uh, word on that too, Tim, as well, if you don't mind. Well, yeah, that was uh, one of the questions we wanted to ask you, Tim, and we were talking for current events. And I did uh, watch some of your recent uh, contributions to uh, Spaced Out Radio, uh, and you talked a lot about legislation that's coming up that uh, should be passed before the end of the year. Rob and I are wrestling with the fact that it does appear like the government is trying to backtrack a little bit now given the UAP report is being held off, given that there have been other FOIA drops that John Greenwald has released, uh, credit to him, that indicate they're trying to backpedal a little bit about, well, those three videos got out and we're not gonna let any more out, those types of statements. <laughs> um, and we're thinking, well, the government may not be so forthcoming anymore so what are we left with? You know, maybe the UAP report comes out, but maybe it's underwhelming as it was last time. There'll be some tidbits in there. What we see or what I see is to, I see two things. The first thing and foremost is what you're doing. The citizens effort to bring out and find the irrefutable evidence that can say this phenomenon is real. Here's the irrefutable evidence. There's no more denying it. Uh, USG, United States government. We, we have found the proof. What are you hiding? And I, I want to ask some more questions about the specifics of what you and your mobile lab have, have captured thus far and how you're going to present that since being an electrical engineer, I'm, I'm all in. And by the way, I am at your disposal. If you need cool. another technical mind to contribute I do control systems yes. engineering. I'm a big hardware and firmware guy. I've done, I've been an electrical engineer for 35 years. So uh, I have a broad experience across many platforms. I see your oscilloscope. So, yeah, oh, yeah. You got all my, this is my uh, yes, sir. dungeon of doom over here. And, uh, you know, one of my current control projects that I'm doing for a marine Excellent. company. But in any cool. event, uh, that's an aside. A uh, little selfish uh, plug there, but I, I have I'm, so much to do. 
that I appreciate that. So yes. yeah, yeah. So uh, besides the the effort you've got, and I think the legislation and the whistleblower acts that you've spoke about so well, and I was really impressed by that on Dave Scott's Spaced Out Radio. That's what Rob and I think are our only vehicles to get there. What do you yeah. think? Well, I'm such a positive person, right? Um, when I get these little tidbits, I see light. I don't see darkness, what they're not giving me, right? So the fact that it's late tells me a lot. And I also kind of know why, right? Um, the UAP desk is empty, right? The director's yes. desk is empty. Um, the task force was nullified, right? And so there's not a lot of information, but they do have reports, right? And so the reports that they have are mixed because some of them come with the conclusion. And mm -hmm. so they don't necessarily rehash something that already has a conclusion. And when you present a report, um, ideally you wouldn't give something that already has a conclusion, especially if it's mundane. If we know it's Russian and China, well, we're not interested. Don't include it in this report. And so my understanding is that there are perhaps quite a significant number of reports that are unexplainable and those are what are to be highlighted. And so extra time is perhaps necessary for that to be done. And so that is my understanding of why it's delayed. That doesn't necessarily mean that the rumor that I'm explaining to you right now is real, but it certainly fits kind of what I've heard from the few people that have come publicly. Um, I mean, recently Danny Sheehan had a little bit to say about this as well. And I kind of agree, um, you know, we're in a very tumultuous political time right now. And, um, this ball is not the number one ball that's being passed amongst the players, right? So we kind of have to wait for that dust to settle for this to come back into the highlight and to hit the press and for the pressure to be felt. Um, now, it is frustrating that there's no one that we can deliver any pressure to on this, right? Who is actually responsible for this report? Right. The, the, the ODNI I, is where it's supposed to come from, but yeah. and that's an organization, but there's no there. Exactly. Right? There's no body there exactly. in it to right. understood. And no, so it's a valid point. And I agree. I concur with your positive take on it. I mean, 50 percent unexplained is better than zero. Right. And so there is some meat there. It may not be 143 out of 144 like the last report, but still there's mean there's there's something there uh even if it's half of them are unexplained there's something there and we yeah. need to get to the bottom of those we had a massive um outlay of information from scu though kind of around the same time and that was more disclosure to me than any um blacked out um you know document we could get from the odni in my opinion because let's just say that they confirmed that the rubber duck video was truly UAP. Mm -hmm. And I felt that that was monumental. Um, and I, I must highlight it here on your show because I feel like it's massive yes. and it hasn't hit headlines. Why hasn't the New York times followed up on their initial report on their excitement about the Navy release of these videos now with the conclusion, which is that it's truly UAP signified by a very highly reputable group of over 140, by the way, scientists working at SCU. Yes. Right. right. They took time to say that the original three 2017 videos were likely explainable now, but they didn't take the time to follow up on the rubber duck, which was now the opposite. It's been uh, confirmed to be UAP and they seem to be turning a blind eye to that. Why and is that? We're giving way too much game time to players like Mick West because he's not really the right spokesperson as a skeptic. Um, right. You know, but that's just my personal take. Yeah. 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 You have to vet the evidence. And speaking of which, you've collected, I'm really impressed with the mobile lab and what you've done. And, and, we haven't talked about this yet, but along the lines of evidence coming from 
the citizens and the and the groundswell efforts here that you're a big part of, along with the other folks you've mentioned that are on your team. Um, what is the can you give us or share with us probably the single most compelling tidbit of evidence that you've collected thus far, be it, you know, from Blind Frog uh, Ranch or from any of the other sites you've uh, camped out at? I mean, what can you share with us that you found so far that uh, you're willing to share that is compelling? Yeah. Um, well, I guess the biggest takeaway for me that I learned over the summer was that all of the hotspots that I've visited have one thing in common, and that is a pretty big piece of information. Um, at the same time as I'm seeing something in the sky, or um, maybe not, but often, um, we're getting magnetic readings, uh, anomalies in the geomagnetic uh radius that we're in so if i'm just getting flat nothing all day start getting negative or positive spikes which is um strange in itself but once i start seeing those fluctuations i can kind of assume that there's something going on uh with the phenomenon interesting yeah and, and that's so, a big part of the uh you went to basin and it's uh geophysical behavior that a lot of yeah. people attribute uh, or and I'd heard or have that. observed. And, and I'd heard that observation before. Mm -hmm. And so I went there and I observed it. And what struck me was that it was the same levels that I was getting in Oregon. Wow. And some of the same levels that matched up in Washington. Okay. So it's not just that one spot then. Right. But let's say there was something in the sky um that had that signature well i'm reading that signature wherever i go in a hot spot if that makes any sense i'm not yes. translating it that way but it's kind of like that except it's coming from the ground you know mm -hmm. which is weird too um it's not anything i can really put my finger on yet but again it's really rough data right it could be there could be so many things factoring in um you know, like water, if there's water down there, um, my, it, it could be my devices. It, it could be my technicians that aren't getting the proper readings. So I, you know, I have to hit them again next year and mm -hmm. see if I can get the same readings and duplicate my, my results. Um, and that's really it. It's pretty tedious and a little bit boring, but this is kind of like where I'm scratching. I'm starting to see that maybe there's something there with that. So you have uh, so you're saying that coincident with some anomalous, we'll call them electromagnetic readings. EMF readings, yep. You're seeing phenomena in the sky visually as well. Yeah, yeah. Go, and can you, what kind of things in the sky are you seeing? So far, important? the only things I've managed to film were balls of light. Okay. Mm. Um, and so they're moving out of our atmosphere though and at rapid speeds and changing directions there, there you go that's what i was wondering so right that, and that they right there and is reappear. Yep. they streak down into the into the water um i haven't gotten anything um well I, i'm sorry i haven't got anything going in i only got something coming out on film but i've seen things going in wow um yeah. And I mean, it happens a lot it, more often than we think. And if you're using the right tech, you can see it, right? Yeah. If you're using Gen 3 night vision, you're going to see it. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, on, on, on what to do with that information yet, right? Because it's it's a lot of people are collecting the same stuff and not sure what to do with it. Um, I don't have an explanation for any of that video. And aren't you using the psionics camera for what yeah. you use? Okay. Yep. Is I'm that um are you familiar with the video uh from what I guess his name is Nikki? Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think about that video? What 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 is your oh. opinion? So I see so much video, right? Um, people um have been really cool about sharing video with me this year. Uh and so I don't publicly uh, go over anyone's video anymore. 
just because I, I don't, I mean, it's tough, right? So I, I try not to give a, an opinion on other people's work. I'll present mm -hmm. my own all day and the public can scrutinize mine, but um, I have a really hard time with that, right? Because I also know Nikki, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same rate, I can't just jump out and support everything and I can't just jump out and not support everything. Right. So I love that he's putting it out there. Um, I would love a real breakdown of it because there's a lot of moving parts in that video. It's really hard for me to break it down, to be honest. Right. Um, I recently got a video. I was asked to review a video for Blind Frog Ranch, right? And I'll just put it out there. You know, I, I reviewed the video. It had been shot through a windscreen, you know, in a car. Why mm. would you not just move the camera outside? Right. You're shooting through a windscreen. Um, so I've got that. And then I've got, a, you know, mirrors and things. And I know it's a truck. So there's glass right here. So there's mm. a lot of moving parts in a video and sure. shot in a cab or in a car. Sure. Um, and so that just sends red flags up for me. Mm. Right? right. Just right. on that. So I have a hard time with a, a lot of other people's work. Um, I'll still look at it and give an opinion directly, but um, I haven't seen anything that's blown my doors off yet mm, okay. um, out there in the public that I can point to and be like, everyone should be looking at this. Okay. There's nothing yeah. I've seen that has done that for me yet. And there's nothing of mine that has either though. Otherwise you'd already have seen it. Um, all I have are just floating lights and, you know, a little bit of data here and there. What um, I do have is um, some FLIR video that is super compelling over controlled airspace. Um, I have what appears to be a perfect X and where these lines intersect. There's like a pulsing uh, circle, right? Okay. And it's just this very odd piece of video that I'm going to include in my documentary here for free for everyone. Um, a lot of people have been like, oh, you know, it's uh, trails from jets, right? Because it's going to read hotter than the background. And so at night it's going to read orange. And so it, it, I would be fine with that as an explanation, except not only did it not move an inch uh, for 40 minutes, but um, it was in controlled airspace. No one was allowed to fly over sure. this location in the Uinta Basin. And nothing was on my ADS data system that I hold with me to see if there's any flights. And I knew what was in the air for hour before and hour after, and there was nothing. Nothing so on radar or anything. Nothing, either. right. So it could it have been two planes intersecting perfectly right above us at this hot spot that don't have you know, two planes that both don't have a signal for right. ADS. I don't know. So, um, you know, I've showed it to some of my peer groups and that's kind of like, if it's not that, then we don't know what it is. If it's not uh, trails from contrail rather then we don't know what it is. So I've got something like that, but again, it's so rough, even living some of these, you're still scratching your head, you know, like what do you do with the data? Well, I share it with the experts and let them hopefully, you know, I try to stay neutral and just be out there collecting the information to be right. completely honest with you. Cause I don't know what I'm looking at always. And it's so, you, you know, right. And honestly, when I get some of this video with gen three night vision, I'm sending it through my channels to the people that know before I show it to anybody, you know, cause I don't want to show something that, again is military is something mm -hmm. that i shouldn't be showing publicly that's the last thing i want to use my tech to do or my radar or all of my special tools because really i could you know get up close to a military installation and do damage i'm not that guy right mm -hmm. i'm not trying to look i'm not going to go next to area 51 and hang out ever <laughs> right i don't right. care about our military secrets i'm interested right. in the stuff that's not ours i'm going to real hot spots right I don't know if that makes sense, but no, it's that's have very, you, very honorable. Have you ever checked? I know you posted your uh in your sighting back through New Fork. Did you uh in the time that all that happened, did, did you go back and look at any other incidents that happened in that same time frame just to kind of see if 
So is someone matched what you saw or something similar? Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole reason I initially reported was hoping that someone else had seen it from another angle or had photos or anything, or if they okay. were having the same dreams. Cause I know I, I went and looked, I just, you know, I did this for a couple different uh, sightings and I just saw that. I don't know how far Kent Washington is from Bainbridge. Um, Bainbridge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, potentially, I mean, this okay. thing could have been seen for, I don't, you know, anyone could have seen it for miles. It was really bright and really oh. obvious. Well, there was a passenger airplane uh, that had to make a quick deviation. And I'll put this in post too. Mm -hmm. uh, on July 5th, 2019, Kent Washington uh, made a quick deviation to avoid collision with fireball shaped orb. So uh, that was the same day as your sighting. And then. Is there a time uh, there? Does not list a time, no. Mine was around, but it's on New Fork. Okay. And then uh, a couple of days later, Gig Harbor had a sighting as well. So I did yeah. that with my own sighting, just kind of looking around to see uh, around the same time frame if other had uh, experienced the same thing. And on mines, actually, which I'll end up talking about in the video after this one, will be um, the my sighting had a lot of them but then to well, colorado the day after the exact same uh crafts crystal clear pictures as well so um i don't know what they're doing but they're definitely in the skies what i saw saw it could have been something that could have been considered some sort of attack formation really yeah uh, with the amount that that i saw so kind of then if that's it if, if I realized at this point that that was a real sighting. Then what does that mean if they're flying around in numbers like that? Yeah. So I don't know. I actually had a question about your sighting. Um, so I know people have tried to say that like they're birds because of the flickering, but that does not appear no. like that to me. It's Did noise. Notice... It's the noise. Well, what I also noticed is that some of them actually disappear and reappear. Yes, in your video, glad you saw that. I'm glad you saw that, which is not typical for a bird. Like, if you're following it, it'll stay there and you'll just keep seeing that you know flicker, which is fine. But they don't disappear and reappear right where they're supposed to be. That's yes, not sir. that's like a very odd I, thing. I'm glad you saw, it, and that's why I put the video out there raw because yeah. and I asked Mick West and other people to take a look at it was for that fact alone. I, I saw in the beginning there were 47, and then a few seconds into the video, you count them again, and a few were missing, right. completely gone. And then yeah. a few seconds after that, they're all gone. And that's yeah. why when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's kind of a UAP signature. You know, I don't, the stuff I film, I don't bother with stuff that I can be like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not a maybe guy. I mean, I'm like, maybe it's a plane. It, you know, it, it's not worth showing the public that. Um, but the stuff that is the, the maybes like yours where, yeah, that's worth showing. It's worth digging into. Now I wouldn't necessarily put it out there in the mailbox of debunkers mm -hmm. because I don't care what a debunker says no matter what he's not going to come back with i don't know yeah. no matter what it's going to be right he's right. going to figure some kind right. of explanation. that's what he gets paid for quote unquote so i i don't send it out i do like putting things out to the public i don't like twitter i don't like those groups because they're already kind of poised ready to attack mm. and it's so easy to sit back and just be like Oh, this is that. I've seen that a million times. Well, I have seen flocks of birds a million times, and I've filmed them, too, with lots of Thank different you. devices. And um, it's it's hard to film birds, by the way, um, just as it's hard to film UAP. But um, after you've done it a lot, I, I understand it can look like it, but doesn't mean that that's what it is. You can't just jump there. And I right. feel like people take shortcuts. You know, right. my sighting and my photographs look like uh, a banner being towed by a plane without, see, the, I didn't without see all that, the photos. Well, without all the photos or without my my family's or my uh, witness description, 
you may disregard it. To me, it was a massive thing, right? To someone just seeing those photos and maybe even hearing my my sighting, they may not be that that's not a big deal. You just saw something in the sky that was probably explainable, right? That's I would the, be go. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tim. I don't mean to interrupt you. I was just yeah. gonna say you brought this point up earlier in the conversation. The the anecdotal evidence here for both your case, uh your case and Rob's. Yeah. <laughs> are key because i was there the day rob saw that and he revealed it to us and his hearing his testimony as to how he was thoroughly convinced it was not birds doesn't come through on the video right. and in your case either if you take your video and give it to somebody without what happened to your family and the details of all the psychological impact that it's had and the description from your mother and all of the your description it it's it pales right it uh, it's going it, it can be easily uh brushed off but you bring in the testimony and the anecdotal evidence and now you could say people like in rob's case saying no those aren't birds and where did they go birds just don't disappear same for you so I, I just wanted to emphasize that because you brought it up earlier, and I feel that's a very important part of all of and, these and cases. To Rob and myself, this was a wow moment, right? This is a life-changing yeah. moment when you're living it. And a camera phone is never going to do justice. Right. You know, even even the right film camera is not going to do justice to the experience because it's still 2D, right? It's a two-dimensional experience, whereas you're living it, you're hearing it, breathing it, seeing it, and you know it's not mundane. That's frustrating. And it's hard enough to tell the story, right? I'm not normally a storyteller. I'm a great writer, but I'm not a, just a storyteller. I'm not comfortable in front of the camera. I'm behind the camera guy. Right. So for me to tell this story, a personal story was really hard. Um, I just have to forget, you know, that I'm on camera and just remember that experience and just describe it play by play because i still don't know what it was and i, I it's no problem for me to leave my opinion out because i don't have one i literally have no opinion as i feel like you do as well and so for a real witness like yourself it's very clear that this was a real experience because there's no yeah. opinion you're not you're not fighting against the skeptics you're honoring a skeptic's opinion because you're looking for the truth Exactly. And so I find it frustrating when witnesses are cut down because honestly, they're just looking for the answers that we're all looking for, which is mm -hmm. what WTF is this? See, that's why I want to make sure. And that's why I'm glad that I sat on it and kind of waited. And then actually it was gifted to me that the, if this new information came to me today because it's the final piece to that puzzle. So the beautiful part of creating a video or being able to is to be able to tell the story the right way, uh, which is what you don't get from just watching the raw video. And I, I know you're a producer too. Have you ever thought about doing like a recreation of your event? Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you thought about that? Yeah, I have an animator I'm working with doing um, a little comedy uh, series. And mm -hmm. I am going to work with him to have him animate it. And yeah. And kind of do that it, it's just it's so hard I, I i i had considered putting the documentary out a while ago on my mm -hmm. family's experience but i wanted to have their permission i don't feel like they're ready you know mm -hmm. believe it or not we're still having dreams from this and not all of us know it's from that right right and so Serious. some of us deal with it internally and you know wonder if it's us yeah, I mean, like I said, I I I dealt with Mick West and King Milk Fart as well. He chimed in also, but uh, they, they, you know, they they were kind of. But I was open to it because I knew what was coming. Like you said, you put it out there to those uh, debunker vultures, and they're just going to try to shred it to pieces. And I kind of wanted them to do that because I knew what I knew, and I just wanted to see if you could show because I'll walk the line. And I, I'll go either way, depending on the evidence. So if yeah. you can present me with enough evidence for me to feel like, OK, yeah, that could be the case. Then that's where I'm at. I'm not going to stand hard on even though I know it what it was. So now at this point that they've uh, called it birds. Now the video is like, OK, well, 
it's going to show something totally different. So you, I just can't wait to get to that. I'll be doing that uh, once we wrap up here for sure. Good. Good. I mean, it does. We do have to walk our own experiences out to the public. It's up to us. Right. And, you know, I tried to I didn't know that I was going to do this. This is one nothing I ever planned. But when I was given this situation, um, I dealt with it the most logical way I knew, which was to make sure it wasn't bollocks. And once I realized it was real, I presented it as it was real. And that's just it. That's all we can do. Um, I, I don't see any problem with anybody doing that with even something that they find out it's mundane. Great. Like some of the recent pilots that have been reporting to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm is Ben Hansen. Yeah. Uh, ben Hansen has been doing great work and, you know, Mick West came out and was like, let's look at some of this evidence that he was given uh, on this being potentially Starlink. Right. And so some of the cases now from there, uh, the racetrack UAP, some of those are now being cons considered Starlink. Well, there's still something to be learned there. Let's say that one of those 10 cases is Starlink. Okay. Well, what we need to do is educate our pilots better so they're not wasting their time looking at Starlink, right? Sure. My opinion is that they were not looking at Starlink. These are trained professionals. Yeah. And so they know what a satellite looks like. Yeah. Absolutely. But my point is if they've been trained now into, you know, knowing that this isn't Starlink, he can come back and be like, I know it isn't. I've been trained. That's right. part of our training. So they can just nip that right in the bud. Right. And so it's that sort of, this is what we have to do. It, it sucks. But that is the kind of world we're living in now where no amount of evidence, even from a trained professional, military professional, it's not good enough. I mean, we've seen Ryan Graves go through the same uh, thing. Sad it's too, just... Yeah. Well, and that's, I guess, that's the approach UP, UAPX was taking, I uh, saw when they showed uh, the infrared uh, video of things like birds, planes landing. So they're like, it's great that we got this data because now we can show you what it's not. And that's kind of like working backwards to get yeah. the result. But yeah. I, you know, I guess that's the same thing you're talking about. It is. And in fact, that's a conversation I recently had where I have a ton of data, right? And a lot of it is mundane. It is birds flying. It is just a natural occurrence that happens in nature. It is, um, you know, just electricity that I'm recording or whatever. Do I release that information with the... Um, the unanswerable data? Do I just release everything together or do I just release the inf the interesting parts? Um, the answer I got was that I need to release everything so that I can show all of my work and so they see why this over here is interesting. It's because I know all this isn't. Does that make sense to you? Or do you think that it's up to us to, as the researchers, to siphon and filter mm. the information? Do you have an opinion? It's a really good question. Yeah, I guess it really depends. I mean, because if it's obviously something that shouldn't be looked at, then yeah, you probably should be distracted to do it first. Yeah, exactly. Just uh, exactly. Or too much information. And, and, and we're talking exactly. about here about being open minded. Right. And we're saying a lot of people aren't open minded. So, in the interest of supporting that, it kind of behooves us to present all the data as you were told, Tim. And I, I I can see where this is going could go wrong though, right? Because once yeah. you you present the uninteresting data that's easily explainable, even if you couch it as that, you know what ends up happening. The, a spin gets put on all of your data. Oh, well, he presented this and this is all easily explainable. So they, they, they gloss over the truly interesting stuff so i know what you're think, thinking is like well let's only give them the stuff that matters so that we don't end up in that situation i, I don't know it's a tough question i i kind of feel that you've earned a reputation to be able to filter and not have to justify the quality of your work 
Others maybe, but you, I don't think you should have to do that at this stage. Of it's it's really anyway. expensive to present data, whether yeah. it's on a website or whatever. Um, right, you have to edit it and put it into the presentation or a documentary yeah. or film. I mean, I it's I get it. We all get it. It's tough what, enough to edit a one YouTube video. <laughs> exactly. Right. What what I had considered was releasing all of the raw data, right? But then just highlighting the interesting stuff in a documentary or something. Do you think that's a better way or am I still just defeating the purpose? I think you could do examples. I would do, I would present the details on the interesting stuff. And then you can say, here are two examples of uninteresting things that I've got reams of as well. You don't want to distract it, distract the people from the, uh, the real value of what you're pro you're providing. I, I wouldn't want that. Like I said, I trust you. You you have a great reputation. When Tim Senor presents his data, I want to see the good stuff. And he doesn't need to justify yeah. his his position on this. But so anyway, that that's my opinion. Um, yeah, because I can tell you for for a fact that uh, we, you know we're both followers of of you, so we've heard you speak on this before. Right. We we've been waiting for that data from you. I mean, it, however long it takes, but you know we're we're waiting for Tim to deliver the the good stuff right. out of the stuff that he has. So you can yeah, acknowledge yeah. this data that you don't think is interesting and give a couple examples, but that's it. And if people are unhappy with that, well tough i i don't think yeah. they're gonna they're gonna crucify you for that and it, it feels weird sitting on it but at the same rate i'm i'm also that guy that i'm just like oh but you're honest um, well there's a big part of me that wants to just release all of it you know as it is and let the public to you Touch know it. scrutinize it and figure it out for themselves but there's just so much of it um and the interesting parts are where things happen at the same time Right. Right. So, you know, um, I'm having all of my things triggered at the same time. Like that's bizarre for that to happen. And how do you show that other than kind of like doc as a documentarian filming right. that all happening? I mean, yeah. You've got to bring it. You've got this is where the work yeah. comes and you have to bring it together. And yeah. Right. Otherwise, if you present it raw, how do you expect people to say, well, this electromagnetic event and this radar hit and this Visual video. camera video all occurred simultaneously. No one will know that. You'll right. have to do the work to bring that together, and I think that's fair. I mean, how that's else a tough can you thing do to it? do, also. And yeah, you can't do it in just one form because a lot of my data is numbers, right? And mm. for me to show you in a video format and describe the numbers. <laughs> Yeah, that it, it, then that people are going to yes, to translate. Right, right. It's 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 tough, and so this is the thing. You know, I'm a filmmaker. This is um, very mm. new to me. You know, um, and to try to do it as a documentarian, which is also new to me. You know, I've never done documentarian work before. Um, I've always been a cinematic kind of guy working on sets. Right. Uh, you know, um, even on location, it was very controlled set. So this is a different kind of thing where um, I, I'm constantly working in an unpredictable environment with an unpredictable format. Mm. And yeah. I may go to a location and walk away with nothing and have to present that as my data, which is going to happen. It's going to happen. I can't always strike gold. Now, it hasn't yet, but only because I, I'm very careful about when and where I go. But at the same rate, I don't expect to always hit. So... Um, you know, at some point I have to reveal the data that shows nothing, correct? Right. And how do some, I do that? So some it's some examples, it's, it's, but yeah. you don't have to present it all. I mean, you can, but say again, that... it's, it's tricky. It's tricky, yeah. especially if you're commissioned to go to a location again, it's really hard to come up and be like, or let's say, for example, if I was a ghost hunter and I went to a location and came up with no ghost evidence, is that still a show? Right. You know, and so it's that kind of thing. You know, mm. if I go to a location that somebody's all excited about, they've been seeing things every day, I go there and I get nothing. Um, that doesn't discredit that location just because I've got nothing, but yet I have to present that data of nothing for that location. You know what I mean? And yeah. so it gets a little sticky. 
Yeah. 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 I wrote in a summary history. of what, what locations produced and what ones from the didn't. history. Yeah. And, and we do that can, sort of thing, but maybe that's again, the overview. And then you dig deep on the ones that did produce. I, I, I know what you're saying. It gets interesting. Though. It's a lot right? of it, material. Yeah. And it, and it gets interesting. And my researchers spend hours with nothing happening for like minutes of excitement, heart pumping. <laughs> Like, oh my gosh, like, don't miss this. And then another two days of nothing. And then maybe 15 minutes of like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then, you know, so it is very much fishing. Stuff. Yeah. I definitely want to see the, oh my gosh. Because I, I, I know you got some things. So we I do see have Tom, some great stuff. Tom King, when he shows just things every day, just I can't even tell you in the sky. Yeah. And what a great sky watcher he is. I've called him a couple of times where while I'm on the phone with him, he captures UAP where he hasn't for days and days and days. I call him. Boom. He snags one like a couple of times that's happened. Yeah. And I don't know whether He's it's just the spot. two of us vibing or just, yeah, I think it's Phoenix. <laughs> He's in a good spot. Yeah, that too, yeah. It's probably Phoenix. Yeah. Cause it's, it's all the time with him. I mean, I've seen, I watched him, he traced it and tracked the movement and I'm like, God, that is definitely UAP. And that's, I wish I was in a it. spot like that. I'm in the middle of the city in South Florida. I can't see a blasted <laughs> thing. So we have to drive. <laughs> In yeah. the middle of the Everglades, if we're lucky. But no, it's great to be in a good spot, Tom is, and that's kudos to him because he yeah. can, I think that affords a lot of opportunities. As you experience, Tim, when you go to your on site locations, you've always chosen good ones, as you just said, and kudos to you for that. And they produce. They do. They, they produce. do. I assume it's everywhere, to be completely honest with you. Yeah. Um, I think a hot spot. If I was to describe a hotspot, I would say that it has either it it, it has a, a natural quality that attracts them, whether it's electromagnetic mm -hmm. or geophysical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think locations that are of interest are also military when the military is doing things, yep. nuclear or energy, you know, any kind of energy production. But the locations that I go to are very much more natural. Um, and so I look for things like dead zones in the ocean. I look for things like um, strange weather in a location for a really long time. Um, there, there's a couple other things that um, seem to be circling around the phenomenon. And I'm not sure whether it's um, historic or you know, or what, but it seems like certain places do attract it um, at a certain time of year. Also, I don't know why that might be. Um, it makes me feel that it's natural. You know, when I hear things like that, that it's something that our planet just has naturally. It's not like necessarily a T, mm. um, you know, that it's just some sort of natural phenomenon that yeah. appears to, you know, it, um, if you see how a bubble floats, it can almost mm -hmm. seem like it's got a mind to it, but right. it doesn't, right? When I've filmed some orbs that are very close to treetops, they appear to have like an intellect to them or they're reacting to me flashing my light at them, but I don't know that, right? Mm. Um, some of these seem like they're just a natural phenomenon, um, kind of like, Oh, and in fact, um, SCU has done studies on orbs and have come up with some pretty interesting information that I am also able to corroborate, which is that certain um, orbs have a certain color temperature, right? And it's almost a signature, whether it's a blue, white, or orange, or whatever that is, it's kind of a signature, and it distinguishes kind of a heat, perhaps, or like a plasma or something like that. But they are able to kind of recreate these on paper. So SCU has done some great work to prove that this is potentially some of it natural phenomenon. Um, mm. We don't have a descriptor for them yet, but they definitely happen in Oregon quite a lot. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things that's absolutely on my radar that I'm not sure about yet. Um, they're, they're not as rare as you might think. Like I've filmed them three or four times, my four times 
myself. Um, and one was, like I said, j uh, just at treetops, kind of floating like a bubble during a rainstorm while it was raining. Um, and if you went to Anonymous Rex on YouTube, I actually have it posted there with the date and the information. Ah, I'm glad you brought that up, sir, because uh, yeah, sure. I did notice that you have. I saw an advertisement for Anonymous Rex Live. Is that a thing? Is that what you you can doing something with that? I know. I, I created that um, over the summer right before I built this lab. So I was going to start going live. Now I do still intend to do that. Something kind of like this. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted it to be with, um, you know, particip participants of my project so that we could be talking about our results mm -hmm. and um, doing that it in a great. live format where people could jump in. If you guys wanted to jump in, we'd put a link and you could come in and ask us or whatever. Yeah. Um, but that way you could talk to the researchers themselves because, wow. you know, I only know this much. Those guys know the rest, you know, independently. So, um, yeah, it's great. really about that. And so that's kind of like my 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 thoughts for Anonymous Rex Live, um, which I'll absolutely be doing. I just, I want to have, you know, we did just start in June. And so I want to have some substance before I start, doing, you know, yeah. proceed to talk on this. I feel like I'm very naive still, to yeah. be completely honest. I'm very new to this. Yeah, but it sounds like you've also collected a lot of data as data, well. Exactly. You've created as long as you're gathering the data, data, then yeah, that that's the important part. Yeah, you can go live later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And a big of it, a big part of it is interpreting that data. I I don't know how to interpret it. So <laughs> there's well, def yeah. definitely hope that you'll at least bless us with uh, a return and maybe share some of that when you're ready to do that. Yeah. And um, if you guys wanted to, I wouldn't mind doing a quick one with you, just going over my sighting with the photos. Yeah, definitely. Yes. And I can just go slide by slide with you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you guys definitely. so much for the invitation. It's been fun. I can't. I didn't know it was your first episode. That's amazing. First guest. Thank and you. I really first guest. Thank you for I'm doing honored. for for coming through and doing that. Yeah. I mean, it, you're one of the guys uh, that I root for. Uh, you know, as far as for what you're doing, the type of person that you appear to be, and you've confirmed that that's exactly who you are. Exactly. Um, and there's there, there's Thank a you. few few others out there, but uh, I definitely am going to put the Anonymous Rex YouTube link in the chat because you got to go subscribe to Anonymous Rex. He's got it going on. He's all over the place. Spaced Out Radio, Fessler one day, here one day, uh, yeah. watching the skies the next, so... Yeah, it's a pleasure working with you today. I'm glad uh, that you stood with us for an hour and a half answering these questions. And Thank like you. I said, please, please come back. Don't hesitate to come back. Yes. Love to. Thank you very Love much, to. Tim. Greatly Great appreciate it. Wow, so sensational interview with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Tim Senor, also known as Anonymous Rex. Please remember to follow his YouTube channel. The link is down in the description. And for everyone else that came through today to the social dig, Thanks for coming. You guys all take care. Till next time.